Um, look, I should just start by um, uh, thanking Seoul National University and the Asia Centre in particular for uh, inviting me along to uh, uh, to present. It's uh, it's nice to be here. It's my first trip to South Korea, and um, anyway, it's a, a step I hope will lead to a sort of warmer relationship between. Uh, um, uh, my academic colleagues and, uh, and myself uh, uh, working on uh, um, political economy issues to do with Asian capitalism and uh, um, the scholars here working, uh, working on the same topic. Um, yes, my uh, paper, um, which is uh, entitled uh, Beyond Predatory Productivism, the Political Economy of Welfare Capitalism in Post-New Order Indonesia, is co-written with one of my uh, PhD students, Marika uh, Van Diemen, who's uh, doing work on uh, the politics of social protection uh, in Indonesia. It emerges out of a research project that uh, I've been working on for a number of years now, looking at um, uh, the politics of social rights um, in Indonesia. Um, as part of that work, I've engaged with a number of different uh, literatures. This is my um, attempt to try and um, engage with the literature on East Asian uh, welfare capitalism um, and uh, East Asian welfare uh, regimes. Um, I've structured the presentation in the same way that the paper is, uh, is structured, so I'll take you through it um, um, section by uh, section, by section uh, mirroring the, the structure of the paper. Um, I start the paper really with a bit of a summary of the way in which um, welfare capitalism in, in Indonesia has been portrayed um, in a number of different literatures. Uh, the first one is the uh, literature on welfare capitalism. Um, in East Asia, um, or alternatively, the literature on East Asian welfare regimes. Those two literatures um, merge together. They overlap uh, uh, quite significantly. Uh, the second is a sort of literature on the politics of social policy in Indonesia. And the, and the third one is um, a popular media commentary on um, the emergence of a welfare state um, in Indonesia. The first literature, the, the welfare capitalism's literature, um, typically portrays um, welfare capitalism in Indonesia as being productivist um, in nature. Uh, productivist is a, is a term coined by um, Ian Holliday in a very, very important paper published back in uh, 2000, um, focused, as I recall, on uh, Japan, uh, Korea and, uh, and Taiwan, certainly uh, Northeast Asian um, case studies, but um, it's been applied more widely throughout the region and Indonesia is typically uh, seen in this literature as being an exemplar of the, the productivist model. Uh, the key features of the productivist model are the subordination of social policy to uh, economic policy and the existence of a growth orient, uh, orientated state. Um, and according to Holiday, this is a distinctive model of welfare capitalism compared to those um, analysed in Esping and Anderson's seminal work, uh, The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, published back in 1990, um, and which was focused largely on um, uh, European and, uh, and North American cases. Um, so Holiday attempted to extend uh, the sort of welfare capitalism framework um, pioneered by Esping Anderson to uh, the East Asian context, but noted quite importantly that, generally speaking, in East Asia, you're not talking about um, welfare states. Uh, there are quite alternative sorts of welfare regimes with those characteristics that I mentioned mentioned earlier. Um, Holiday distinguished between a number of different types of productivist uh, welfare regime. One of them he called developmental particularist, um, and um, uh, subsequent uh, analysts have uh, tended to locate Indonesia in that particular subcategory. Uh, the key feature of the developmental particularist uh, regime is that um, to the extent that states um, uh, provide welfare, they tend to concentrate it on uh, particular sets of individuals, in particular those deemed to be uh, productive elements within society. That might include uh, government officials, members of the military, uh, formal sector workers and so on. The second sort of image that emerges um, uh, in this case from um, the literature on the politics of social policy in Indonesia tends to emphasise the role of predation and corruption in undermining uh, government efforts to uh, deliver social protection to citizens. Um, 
you know, key figures in this sort of literature are people like uh, uh, Ed Aspinall and um, uh, Ramesh. Um, and they point out that, um, you know, particularly in the post-New Order period, that is the period since the, the Asian financial crisis, since 1998 um, in Indonesia, um, there have been a series of social programs uh, introduced, but the effectiveness of those programs in providing uh, social protection to citizens has been undermined by um, capture um, uh, of those programs and the benefits that they deliver by um, officials of the state. A third image that's quite contradictory um, or, or differs quite markedly from the earlier uh, two uh, images of Indonesian welfare capitalism betrays it as an emerging welfare state. And this is the vision of, of Indonesian welfare capitalism that, emer that has emerged in particular through popular media commentary on, um, the, um, uh, on this particular topic. Um, there have been quite sort of um, widely discussed articles published in The Economist and in Time magazine, a bit of commentary in the Indonesian media itself as well, which has suggested that with the introduction of these social protection programs that I mentioned earlier in the, in the wake of the Asian financial crisis, uh, that Indonesia is taking important steps towards becoming um, a welfare state. Now what I try to do in the paper is basically explain why Indonesia has developed a model or a form of welfare capitalism that has these um, uh, sort of multiple and um, apparently contradictory um, elements. And the key sort of, um, or the argument I suppose falls into three main parts and uh, this, uh, this slide here summarises the, first, um, the first, uh, first part of the argument and it's that these different visions of Indonesia's welfare capitalism and the underlying reality that they seek to, seek to describe reflect contradictions within the nature of Indonesian welfare capitalism. Specifically they reflect contestation between competing political and social forces over the policies and institutions that govern social welfare in Indonesia, the different agendas and interests that underpin this contestation, and the balance of power between these forces. The second element of the argument is this contestation has meant that the nature of welfare capitalism in Indonesia has been simultaneously shaped by productivist, predatory and progressive agendas, not merely one or the other. And the result has been the emergence of a welfare regime that has multiple and contradictory features. While it's predominantly productivist and predatory in nature, it also has significant <coughs> progressive elements. Um, the third element is uh, in the argument is that um, just kind of refers back to the to the literature, which I um, sort of suggest presents different images of Indonesian capitalism that are not so much incorrect as simply partial. And in that respect, I, I make reference to the to the parable about the blind men and the elephant, uh, where you know one blind man touches one part of the elephant and thinks it's a particular animal, another blind man uh, touches a, um, a different part of the elephant and thinks it's a, a an, another type of animal. Um, what they get is very, very partial views. And uh, what I'm trying to um, provide in this paper is uh, what I refer to as a whole of elephant um, <coughs> perspective on the nature of uh, Indonesian welfare capitalism. The second part of the paper is a sort of theoretical um, um, interlude in the paper where I try to map out the nature of the perspective that the paper uh, offers and to locate it within the uh, larger literature on uh, welfare capitalism, particularly um, as that literature relates to East Asia. Um, essentially, I kind of say that the existing literature on East Asian welfare capitalism has um, a number of key features. One is uh, that it tends to be a, um, um, focused largely on model building. Um, Esping Anderson's initial work identified three clusters um, or, or types, broad types of uh, welfare capitalism in the countries that he examined. Um, and the literature on East Asia sort of extends that um, approach uh, broadly to uh, the East Asian um, context and there's a lot of discussion about you know whether for instance productivism is the the right sort of label the right sort of uh, model to um, describe all East Asian um, welfare capitalist systems uh, whether there in fact uh, is more than one uh, model within the region and so on um, and some scholars have offered competing 
competing models. Um, a second sort of feature of the literature is that um, um, to the extent that there is an effort to explain the nature of welfare capitalism within the region, it tends to rely either on culturalist expectation, uh, explanations or um, ones that emphasise development strategy, the role of uh, developmental states and so on. Um, and both of those um, approaches, for slightly different uh, reasons, uh, lack a dialectic element. Um, the sort of developmental statist, uh, developmental strategy approach tends to present a sort of functionalist um, analysis. The culturalist one seems to or, or suggest that models of welfare capitalism are essentially a, um, a reflection of timeless cultural val values. And again, for that reason, lack a, um, lack a dialectic element. So I, I adopt a model that draws in particular on um, Sam Hickey's work on the politics of inclusive development and the politics of social protection. Um, also the sort of social conflict uh, approach that's been pioneered by um, people at Murdoch University um, in Australia in their work on Southeast Asia's political economy um, uh, and, that sort of, uh, and that sort of approach. And this approach um, has a couple of key elements which I summarise on this slide. I mean, the first is that it emphasises uh, the role of contestation between competing actors' interests and agendas in shaping social policy within specific country, institutional and historical contexts. And secondly, that it emphasises the role of domestic um, actors in particular. Um, and this includes popular sources. Uh, Sam Hickey talks a lot about political settlements, drawing on uh, Mushtaq Khan's uh, work on that sort of, um, uh, on that sort of topic. Uh, the people associated with the Murdoch School of Political Economy and the social conflict approach uh, likewise emphasise the role of uh, domestic actors. I mean, in particular, uh, domestic class forces, but also domestic um, um, uh, sort of broader strata, um, such as, um, um, uh, you know, what Richard Robeson, for instance, in the Indonesian context is referred to as politico-bureaucrats, that sort of strata of state officials that that merge political and bureaucratic uh, power. In the third part of the paper, I identify the actors' interests um, and agendas that have been at play in struggles over or contests over uh, the nature of welfare capitalism in Indonesia. And broadly speaking, um, this, is, this section a sort of, offers a, a heuristic device that obviously is a sort of simplification. Um, so it, it, it entails a broad grouping of um, uh, quite diverse actors, um, but nevertheless, um, you know, it's useful in terms of constructing uh, the analysis. And there are three broad sets of actors, interests and agendas that uh, I identify in the paper. The first are liberal economic technocrats in government and their supporters within the donor community and other institutions controlling mobile capital. And broadly speaking, I say this is the, um, you know, this is the agenda that these actors have pushed in relation to uh, welfare capitalism in Indonesia. They've supported state investment in social policy as a way of building the country's human resources, creating a political and social environment conducive to market-oriented economic reform, and in so doing, contributing to economic growth. So they've been willing to um, support investments um, in the social policy area, but it's always been with the important caveat that these investments must serve the broader project of promoting um, economic growth, um, either via the development of human capital um, or via the uh, maintenance of political stability, which is a sort of key consideration in uh, the Indonesian context given the, the country's um, history of violence uh, particularly during the 1960s. At the same time, this coalition has argued that social programs need to be affordable, cost-effective and based on evidence about what works and why. Um, that's been a particularly strong element in, the, um, in the, um, the view of the donor community, the World Bank especially. The second uh, group, um, or the second broad coalition that I identify are predatory military and bureaucratic officials who've occupied the state apparatus and the domestic and foreign business groups to which they've been connected. 
Um, like the first coalition, this group have viewed social programs as a useful way of promoting economic development through their contribution to human resource development and political and social stability. But they've had a stronger interest in limiting government spending on social policy to free up resources for other areas of public spending, infrastructure in particular, um, uh, public subsidies of uh, finance and, um, and other things that have been more central uh, to their business activities. They've also had a further interest in the introduction of social programs that privilege military and bureaucratic officials, for instance, by providing them with pension and other benefits, opportunities for corruption or opportunities to fuel patronage networks and buy electoral votes. The final coalition are the poor and their allies in the NGO movement. And broadly speaking, this set of actors are sought to promote expanded and equitable access to social protection um, in accordance with notions of human rights and a radical critique of neoliberalism, uh, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the privatisation of public services. In the next section of the, the paper, I then look at the new order period and the post-new order period and the way in which contests um, between these different groups have led to slightly different outcomes in terms of the nature of uh, welfare capitalism in Indonesia, uh, in particular via the adoption of different sorts of social policies. Um, and broadly speaking, the argument says that, you know, you had a particular constellation of interests, um, uh, you had a particular set of power relationships during the new order period. That shifted slightly um, in the post-new order period because of the fall of the Suharto regime um, and the, uh, its replacement by a more democratic uh, and decentralised uh, political system. So during the new order period, essentially, and I'll keep this fairly short because I'm um, running close to time, uh, but broadly speaking, during the new order, the argument here is that you know, the, the first two of those coalitions were, dominate, uh, were dominant and that led to the emergence of a form of welfare capitalism that had three key features. The first was very limited government investment in social programs, very, very little spending in this area at all. Um, to the extent that there was some investment, there was a strong focus on programs that helped to promote growth and stability. And the key initiative during that particular time was a rice price stabilisation scheme uh, managed by uh, Bulog, the National Logistics um, Agency. There was a bit of money went into education and health as well, but relatively little compared to um, many other East Asian uh, countries, and in particular places like Korea and Taiwan that are uh, typically seen as the primary exemplars of the, the productivist model. And the third element was a privileging of productive elements, um, including via opportunities for corruption. So at the same time that Bulog had this role in stabilising rice prices, something that's seen as crucial to maintaining political um, and social stability. Um, the military which controlled uh, Bulog were ripping the organisation off for, uh, for, for an awful lot of money at the same time. During the post-New Order period, um, the argument is that you've had a slight shift in the constellation of, of, of power and interest, a slight change. Um, those first two coalitions have broadly remained dominant, um, but uh, with the fall of the new order, the emergence of a more democratic political system, um, the poor and their NGO allies have had, for a variety of different reasons, greater um, power and influence, greater scope to um, influence the policy making process, and in particular that related to social policy. An array of policy spaces have opened up. Um, they've also been able to organise and mobilise um, more easily than they did um, during the period of authoritarian rule. So you've had, as a result, the emergence of a slightly different form of welfare capitalism, one that's got very strong continuities with the past, um, but uh, nevertheless is different in um, important ways. Firstly, there's been more significant government investment in social programs. Uh, this started um, uh, in particular at the time of the Asian crisis because of the very um, almost disastrous uh, impact of the Asian crisis on um, Indonesia's social situation. Um, it's been kind of capped though, I mean it hasn't been a, a, a dramatic shift but nevertheless social spending's gone up um, quite a bit compared to new order times. You've had a continued focus on programs that help promote growth and stability um, but there's been an extension um, away from you know, a, a sole focus on 
uh, rice, which remains an important area of social investment, but to include education and health as well. So there have been very, very important initiatives in, in those areas. There have also been um, a, a couple of important cash transfer schemes uh, introduced. The final element has been um, a continued privileging of productive elements, um, including via opportunities for corruption, uh, but with an increased orientation towards, um, uh, towards universalism. And I might just conclude things with one further, one further comment, because I'm on the last slide. I mean, in the conclusion, I return to the sort of claims of The Economist and Time magazine that you know, Indonesia is on a trajectory now towards uh, becoming a welfare state. I say, well, look, that's possible, but essentially it's contingent. And it's contingent upon the political struggle between these different coalitions and the way in which that plays out over time within the context of you know, potentially changing political institutions and um, a potentially changing economic context. All right, I better leave it there.